Good afternoon and welcome to this Construction Manager and BIM Plus webinar in association with Hilti. Today's subject is Clearing the Air, How Dust Exposure is Impacting Health, Safety and Productivity. This session is due to run for around an hour today up until about 3.30 this afternoon. And we've got three speakers for you today. We've got Matthias Janefelt, General Manager from Hilti, John Saunders, Principal Ventilation Scientist at the Health and Safety Executive, and Andy Lawrence, Higher Compliance Manager for Travis Perkins. I should also just introduce myself. My name is Neil Gerrard, and I'm Associate Editor of Construction Manager Magazine, and I'll be chairing the session today. Just to talk you through some of the points that we're going to be covering this afternoon, we're going to be looking at the current landscape and issues surrounding dust exposure, how to assess and control the risk of dust on construction sites, as well as looking at the HSE report assessing the different performance of three similar dust extraction system solutions and what it means for tool selection. We'll also consider access to dust removal systems in the marketplace and selecting the right system for the job, as well as productivity gains and the additional benefits that you can have from improved control measures. Each presentation today from our three speakers should take around 15 minutes, which will leave us uh, a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. And just coming on to that, I'm sure a lot of the people attending today will have used Zoom before, but just to run through this, uh, you should find that there is a Q&A function that you can use uh, to ask questions at any point you like during the presentations. Our panelists will try to answer those questions using the Q&A function once they finish presenting. And any, un any unanswered questions that we have at the end of the session will be addressed in the Q&As uh, after the three presentations have concluded. So. Uh, I am going to um, unshare my screen in a moment, and uh, I'm going to ask Matthias, please, if you can share your screen. Uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Very good. Thank you, Gerard. Do you see my screen? I do, yes. Very good. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar also from my side. I really appreciate that you are here with us as this is such an important topic. Let me begin by stating the obvious. Dust is really a serious threat to the construction industry. And why is it so? First, dust from concrete and especially from the small particles, respirable crystalline silica, RCS, are seriously harmful to human health. And in construction, there are many applications or work that generate significant amount of dust unless managed well. And once dust is in the air, it causes both health risk and also it drives significant costs, such as costs for protecting the workers, sealing of areas, cleaning the sites, and productivity losses through, for example, poor visibility, etc., etc. It also affects the appeal of the construction industry from potential employees' point of view. It's not great to work in a construction site with a lot of dust in the air. When I mentioned that dust from concrete is a serious threat to human health, I really meant it. It's important for all of us in construction industry to know that RCS has now been classified as carcinogen. We should consider this a watershed moment and look at managing dust with the seriousness it deserves and requires. Over time, regular exposure to fine dust on construction sites leads to severe long-term health problems for workers like lung cancer, silicosis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And these are life-limiting and life-threatening serious diseases that could be avoided. And the numbers are quite staggering. The statistics from the Health and Safety Executive show that there are around 500 deaths every year due to silica-related lung cancer. HSC statistics also show that there are around 4,000 deaths per year due to COPD related to dust exposure. And let me put these figures in perspective. Latest numbers from the Health and Safety Executive reveal that there were 40 fatal injuries to the construction workers at work in the year ending 31st March this year. The year before, the figure was 31. Over the last five years, the number of accident-related deaths has ranged between 31 and 47, with a five-year average of 37 deaths per year. 
And all of these accidents are very regrettable, but it's also very clear that the order of magnitude of fatalities related to dust exposure is very different. So the key question for us in the industry is, how can we reduce the health risk from construction dust? And the way I see it is, we have to educate people working in this industry of the dangers of dust. From awareness point of view, the challenge is that the health effects of dust typically come slowly over time, over years. And as such, it's not as dramatic as accidents, but the consequences are devastating. We as industry have to find ways to reduce the workers' exposure to concrete dust, and there are many ways to do this. And finally, we need to help the workers help themselves to stay safe and well. We are not without arms in the fight against the health risk from dust on construction sites. There are many things we can do, and here are some examples. First, designing out dust generating work, for, for instance, prefabrication, and better design practices leading to less corrective work on the job sites. Choosing applications that generate less dust, for instance, wet diamond sewing instead of breaking concrete, or direct fastening nails instead of drilling and screwing. Removing dust at source, and this is what I'm going to talk about in a moment. Sealing off areas to reduce the spreading of dust, and as final line of defense, using personal protective e equipment. From Hilti point of view, we have worked together with the health and safety executive to jointly find ways to address the dust problem. A specific area of collaboration relates to the testing of dust generated by power tools and effectiveness of dust removal systems. We believe that facts and data are the foundation of good decision making. There is a key piece of regulation called the European Standard EN uh, 50632 that has been specially created for measuring dust created by power tools in real environments and the effect of their on-tool dust extraction solutions where appropriate. The aim of the standard is to limit dust exposure to workers and help them live a healthy life. However, there is a challenge, namely the availability of re reliable public testing data and reports to help the companies and workers make the best choices for them and avoid poor choices. We at Hilti thought long and hard about how to best take the issue to the wider market and contacted HSE about testing power tools and their dust removal capabilities. We traveled from Manchester to Hilti's Global Dust Research Center based in Kaufring, Germany, along with the HSE, who came to see our dust testing facilities and to begin the research into the independent HSE reports. Specifically, what the HSE team has first tested is the dust extraction system solutions for handheld electric diamond cutters. Cutting concrete is one of the applications that typically generate a lot of concrete dust. What HSE wanted to understand is how effective are the on-tool dust removal systems to reduce dust in the air. And there were very important findings in the study. One, on-tool dust removal systems can be very effective in rem removing dust at source before it's spread in the air. The best systems remove 99.8% of dust as the cut is being made. This supports the well being and health of the workers and drives productivity too, as there is no need to seal off areas and cleaning afterwards. The other key finding was that all dust removal systems are not equal. In fact, there was much bigger difference in actual effectiveness of the tested dust removal systems than anticipated. This graph so shows the results of the amount of respirable dust concentration in the air in the breathing zone of the operator of the tool. System here means the concrete cutting tool itself with the dust removal system and the vacuum cleaning unit that has been designed for the tool. HSC tested three systems from major international manufacturers, Hilti being one of them. There was a great difference in the tool's performance with system one measuring 0.85 milligrams per cubic meter, system two measuring 7.65 milligrams per cubic meter, and system three measuring 16.55 milligrams per cubic meter for RCS, the respirable silica dust. The system two generated hence nine times more respirable dust than system one, and system three generated 19 and a half times more dust than system one. 
Here's a table summarizing the concentration of respirable and inhalable dust in the breathing zone. One way to look at this is that there's only one system that actually works, having truly the right performance. Another way to look at this is that the user of system one can work nine times longer than the system, user, system two user, and 19 times longer than the user of system three before they have been exposed to the same amount of dust in their breathing zone. Hilti has over many years invested in dust research, and our goal is to make the most productive and safe tools for construction professionals. And I'm very happy to say that the system one is Hilti system. Here are some pictures from the test. Hilti diamond cutter with dust removal system removes 99.8% of dust at source as the cut is being made. And of course, I was very happy to see the results for Hilti. But I was also very concerned to see the test results for the other two systems that were tested. And why I'm saying that? Because I'm afraid that when workers are using dust removal systems, they believe they are safe. Also, their managers believe their workers are safe when they have provided them with tools with dust removal systems. However, as we can see here, if the system actually does not perform at the level it should, the operator is still in danger. This might lead to a false sense of security and false sense that the company has now addressed the problem and fulfilled their obligations. This is also a stark example why it's important that there is a reliable data available to help the workers and the industry make the right choices and to avoid poor choices and hopefully encourage all manufacturers in the industry to invest in developing dust removal systems that actually work. So what are the next steps for us at Hilti? First, we will continue to innovate and develop even better solutions to manage dust at construction sites to make them safer. Both on-tool dust removal systems, but also other solutions to help construction companies and workers to deal with the dust and other health and safety issues. We are also working with our key partners and the media to get this important message out there. And we do this because it's clear that no one company or a regulator can solve this issue alone. It's all about innovation, collaboration and sharing of information and best practices. It all begins with awareness and learning what can be done to provide a cleaner air for our workers to breathe. That is why I'm so happy that you have been joining the webinar today, because together we can make a real difference. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to hand over to, to John Saunders. Thanks very much, Matthias. John, if you'd just like to share your screen. Okay. OK, can you see that? I can indeed. Thanks very much. Great. Just one second. I don't think that's... There you go. OK, just to clarify, my name is John Saunders. I work for HSC, uh, the Science Division, so I'm not a regulatory inspector. Um, so the Science Division uh, is mainly most of the people uh, from our SD unit are at Buxton. And that's where I'm based in the laboratory. So I lead a, a small team of scientists, and we look at mainly health risks. So uh, within the team, we, we look at uh, airborne risks, such as um, aerosols. Uh, we also measure uh, particle size of, air, uh, of size fractions of, of, of dust in air or, or, or particles, usually particle measuring. And in addition to that, uh, we do uh, RPE within the team, noise and vibration and extraction. And it's really extraction that's, that's my kind of personal background. So uh, we've been quite busy actually recently with the COVID with, with, the, with the topics that we deal with. And so within to we carry out uh, research work for HSE uh, as, as well as reactive work and, and the occasional incident investigation. And we also undertake some commercial work and, and, and what Matthias has mentioned earlier was a piece of commercial work we did for, for Hilti. So what, what I'd like to do today is I'm just gonna to touch on a little bit more about silicosis and then I'm gonna look at the hierarchy of controls and why, why we need to look and follow those. Uh, look at RP a little bit and, and point some guidance that might be useful. And then uh, have a look at power tools and then the standard, uh, which uh, Matthias mentioned earlier, and just have a, look, a closer look at how that standard's constructed and what it can and can't, can't do for you. 
Okay, so if I just move on to the next slide. So silicosis, as I might say, it's a little bit of revision in a way here, but uh, what, what, what you're interested in is really, this is the respirable fraction that comes off when you're either cutting or drilling or working with the stone. And it's typically less than 10 microns in, in diameter. Um, it's actually not a straight cut off, it's, not, it's actually more of a curve, but it's in that small size fraction. And, and these, this is the, the, the particles that when you inhale can, can, can go into the deep lung and whilst a lot of them will be, be breathed out again and exhaled, uh, you, it's easy to get these in the, in the lung itself and retained in there. And once they're in there, they, they are very difficult to clear if, and, and, not, and, and they will remain there basically. Now, the exposure limit for silica, respirable crystalline silica is 0.1 milligrams per cubic meter. So it's an extremely low level. And that concentration in the respirable fraction in the air is essentially invisible under normal lighting, unless, unless it's backlit or, um, uh, which I'll show you a couple of slides later where you, you can see, or a couple of images later where you can see a backlit photo. And it, it does help to, uh, uh, to, to, to pick out those small, small, small particles. So that's point one is the eight hour time weighted average. So that's over kind of a working day. So it's a highly, uh, got a high toxicity uh, RCS. And, and so that's why even low doses over a number of years, you can get silicosis. So it's, a, it's what we often refer to as a long latent, latency disease. So you can, you can be exposed to low levels and you will have no reaction uh, but then gradually you'll find the shortness of breath, et cetera, that's, that's related to silicosis and, and other, other lung diseases. And unfortunately with silicosis, there's, there's no known, known cure. You, know, you can have a lung transplant if it's, uh, it's life-threatening, but it's, uh, it's a severe disease. So as always, it's, it's uh, prevention and uh, early in de de detections are key uh, to, to uh, a healthy lifestyle when you're working with uh, or, uh, or substances that can contain RCS. So what you do is you, we're looking at the hierarchy of control and you'd be familiar with, with this. And on the left hand side there, you can see we've got the, the best control effectiveness ranging from top to best at the top and the lowest kind of effectiveness at the bottom. And also the business value on the right where um, you, you often it's, it's, it's difficult to cost all these, but when you think of PPE, uh, you think of maybe a, a face mask has been quite cheap, but when you actually go about setting up a, a RP program for a company, it's, it's not cheap. And these are often disposable masks and the, the cost can be quite excessive and, and significant. So as Matthias says, the, the initial idea and the best way of doing it is design it out in the first place. And I, I do recognize that clearly if you're working with stone, that's not, not usually possible. Um, but uh, we did talk about um, eliminating from the workplace the need to cut. So the need to generate activities that generate dust. And Matthias mentioned there about prefabrication. So having, having uh, stone or, or materials containing uh, crystalline silica uh, delivered or pre-cut. Uh, then substitution is using something um, else instead, which isn't again, always possible. But I will just touch on here, um, artificial stone. There's been a, a, a focus on, we've just carried out a research project on artificial stone. It's mainly used for uh, countertops and kitchen tops, et cetera. But, uh, there's been noted that that I think it's possibly because of the title artificial stone. It, it, people think it doesn't contain stone. Well, most of it does. There are some that are uh, free of uh, silica, but most of them contain silica and high, very high proportions. So just be aware if you are working with artificial stone, uh, you should treat it unless you know otherwise and got the, uh, the material data sheet. Uh, treat it as uh, it does contain stone dust. Um, so on the engineering controls, which we come to next, is usually for, depending on the process, but let's say uh, cutting, it was usually water suppression or extraction. So both of these can be very effective and there's this evidence for both of them being effective. Water can have its limitations because it depends where it, you can use it, where it's uh, available to use. And on, obviously, as you are uh, pouring water onto the cutting blade, you are creating a slurry, which be could, could become a slip hazard. And then often it needs removing. So it's how, how do you get, how do you remove them? And, and not so useful when you're maybe working at height, et cetera, on a, on a, on a, on a construction site, maybe on a different story. Um, also when that slurry dries, is there is a, 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 a risk that that dry dust can be partially resuspended. And, and so it becomes airborne again. Extractions, the, the other one, again, uh, that's his limitations because you've got to get the power there. You need an extraction 
uh, unit that's a vacuum unit that attaches to it. And whilst the vacuum unit doesn't move a huge amount of air, these are obviously have high filtration inside. So we don't want to resuspend the dust afterwards. So on construction sites, you'd be usually using type uh, M, but like a medium type. And this is again tested against a different standard we're talking about today, but it is. Uh, uh, it, these are tested and classified, or a type H, which is kind of a high efficiency, and they will be usually marked on the on the on the vacuum unit as a as a M or a H with some red uh, diagonal bars across. Um, the other one is you've got there is administrative controls, and this comes down to training, scheduling work, as we talked about, uh, only working in areas that's been taped off, and so there's a whole host of administrative controls, but can can fail because uh, it's. Uh, uh, can be ignored or uh, perhaps the training isn't as, as good as it could be. And, and last but not least, we have uh, PPE. And so I um, put there a, a last resort. And what we shouldn't do here is jump straight to PPE. And one of the reasons for this is if you think if you are cutting in a relatively enclosed space, then once you cut that um, stone, that, that, that fine dust, which I mentioned earlier, is pretty much invisible to the naked eye at the exposure limit. It will hang around, it does not settle out at all quickly. So it basically it doesn't matter that it's stone and you think of stone as being heavy, it will not settle out. So the, the, the kind of the, the, the particle size, particularly in the, the smaller fractions, you know, less than about four microns, it will just hang with the air. It doesn't move through the air, it will move with the air. So it will just pervade the whole workplace. So if you're wearing RPE, is your colleague who's all potentially in that room working on a different uh, part of the work process, is he or she being protected? So, and, and then also, at what point do you remove your uh, protective equipment, your RPE, because that dust is still in the air? So yes, you will to see the, the plume coming off the tool, but then that background, uh, uh, background concentration in the air, depending on, on the ventilation in the space, how, how open it is, et cetera, could hang around literally all day. Um, so you, we have to be take care. So the reality is what you'll end up with is a mix of controls. And it might be that um, the, the, the extraction or the water suppression just isn't quite good enough and you will need RP to supplement it. So just looking at uh, RP, and the reason we don't jump to it also, I mean, the laws governing the control of hazardous substances in the workplace and the supporting approved codes of practice actually state that you should not use RP or you should only use RP, sorry, after you've taken all other kind of reasonably practical uh, measures to prevent exposure. So you really do not jump to RP. We start at that higher point. And there's, there's numerous failure modes, unfortunately, with RP and the, you know, RP can interfere, for example, with the P head one PPE. And as I mentioned earlier, it does really only protect the wearer uh, um, um, so, as I say, when do you remove your mask? Um, and also for tight fitting RP, you really do need to be uh, fit tested uh, because it all depends on on your face profiles, which mask would would fit you. And if and if you have, if you're a male and you've got stubble, it it, it does um, compromise the RP substantially. So I put on there a, a useful link if you're interested in HSG 53's uh, publication. And incidentally, um, I would advise and, and recommend you go to the HSC site because there's a wealth of information on silica there as well. So it's a good part of, uh, point of call to look and search for the HSC website if you don't already. And also, uh, we've just touched on RPA again, we've got to mention that heat stress communication issues and compatibility, that's, that's just compatibility with other, other PPE. Now, I did talk about the, some, some images I might have. So these are two images of a polishing process and a cutting process. Yes, you'll be able to see this without the backlighting, but this gives you the full view of the airborne particles. So this is backlit. We've got a powerful floodlight behind the worker. This is a little bit like if you're sat in your front room on a Sunday morning, on a sunny day, the, the curtains are closed and you can see a gap in the curtain. You get that beam of light that comes through and you suddenly see dust motes appear and disappear as they float through. It's exactly the same process, that forward scatter of the light. And it's quite, well, excuse the pun, it's quite illuminating. If you ever want to, if you've got a sight light, floodlight, just give it a try. You'll be able to see how well your tool is, is, is being, the, the dust emitted is being controlled. But with the advancement in these type of tools and their ability to get the, uh, the, 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 the um, productivity increase, the, the, there's a couple of downsides that come to mind. When you're using one of these tools, you've got a really powerful dust generating tool in your hands, and it can generate massive amounts of, of airborne dust and, and hence 
um, RCS as well. Uh, very difficult to control. And whilst I mentioned earlier about the long latency, there are cases um, quite frequently now of people working with um, stone cutting uh, and they're getting silica, uh, silicosis at quite young age after only a few years. And it's largely to do with this extreme uh, exposure situations where you're generating uh, enormous clouds. If you think back to the hand tools, you wouldn't get this amount. And the other problem you've got is they are often, uh, in this case, the one on the left, you can see that that's quite directional. You've got two jets. You've got the one coming back towards the work that's illuminated. And then on the far side of the piece of stone, you've got a second jet. Um, so it's, it's, it's two, two jets, a, set, a primary and a secondary, very directional, high speed, extremely difficult to control. Um, you, so you need to plan how you're going to do that. If you do not use on-tool extraction for this or water suppression, you would have to carry out this out in an enclosed booth and you would be talking uh, very high flow rates in comparison to extraction. So the closer you get to the, to the source, the, 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 the lower the airflow rate you need to control it. And the one on the right is a polishing one, and that's like almost like a donut as it comes off the, off the, off the stone, and you can see the huge concentration, uh, huge just uh, concentrations there. So this is why it, we control at source with this. Uh, it always moves, the beauty is it moves with the tool. So as you move the tool, you don't have to keep repositioning any hoods. Um, unless you're going to work in a booth. And how do you assess how, how well it is? Well, you, we can do personal sampling. And one of the things, and it's a, 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 relatively, a relatively new standard, is the EN50632. Now, uh, I'll just say that we, we weren't part of developing this HSC. We do sit on a few standards. We weren't part of this development, but it, it is based on, an, on another standard called EN. 1093, which is on the third bullet point down. And we were involved in that many years ago. And that's about emissions from machines. So it's how you assess emissions from machines. So what you do with this test is, is what we're trying to do is find out how much comes off. Now, there's different ways of doing it. As I say, we can measure, we can try and capture everything and measure downstream. In this scenario with 50632, what we do, we, we have personal samples on the worker. So you carry out a standard test for a particular tool uh, whether that's stone cutting or drilling. And you carry out in, a, in an unventilated large room. Uh, so it's fairly, you know, it's kind of creating fairly poor conditions, but it is a big space. Um, and then the, the operator wears two respirable samplers. Now the respirable samplers will sit either side of the, of the chest and within the breathing zone, usually within 30 centimeters of the breathing zone. Uh, uh, and then you have one inhalable sample as well. And the idea here is that these basically are a pump sample. The respirable samples will take out the larger particles and capture the smaller ones that go into the deep lung, sample onto a filter via a pump, and these are weighed later to find out how much dust. And essentially, the, the operator has to carry out five cycles. So if, we, if, if we stick with a cutting example, five cuts of, uh, over a certain fixed time period with a rest po point in between, and then you get the average for the two respirables and you take the inhalable. We'd be bothered about the respirable samples for RCS, less so important is the inhalable one. And then you repeat that at least three times and you get an average. And that allows you to come up with uh, a, a number that will give you milligrams per cubic meter. And I'll just come to, to what that means later on the summary slide. But it does allow in the, uh, for uh, comparative tests for this exercise so it is for this fixed exercise in this situation so it's not exactly what you're going to meet in in your workplace but it, otherwise it's difficult to compare so it's a it's a a comparative test it's useful for that therefore for comparing the performance of tools on how their extraction eff effectiveness but it's also kind of a quite a useful uh, tool in a way to use by manufacturers for helping them to work and develop uh, better controls because they can they can tweak the control, try and make it more effective, and then look at how that's affected the exposure. So it's uh, useful for for both manufacturers to optimize design, and useful for end users as a comparison. A comparison. Um, as part of the uh, commercial work we did for for Hilti, we did actually review uh, as well as carrying out tests for them. We did also reviewed their their own test facility, which they have, and possibly other manufacturers have. I'm not sure. Um, but we, we, made, we basically, we were asked by them to make sure it complied with the EN standards. So it was basically an audit of their facilities. So this is things like, you know, it does the test room conform to the standard. The sampling equipment are using the right type of sampler that conforms to the respirable convention. 
the correct filters, are you weighing the filters appropriate, is everything calibrated, et cetera, et cetera, pumps. Uh, and we, did, we carried that out for Hilti just to make sure that their um, facility met the requirements. So I just want to summarize with the, we've talked about the, the, the control of dust at source uh, and how effective it is. This is one method, this uh, standard of, of compare and effectiveness. I would add a caveat though, just to say that the concentrations that you will see reported, uh, you can't really compare that to your situation and to the exposure limit because whilst this is a standard test, you will not be working in the same way. So for example, a task duration, you, you may be working for a shorter time period. It might not be in a fully enclosed space, might be you're working for longer. For example, with the cutting, how deep are you cutting with the tool? What type of blade are you using, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, it, the, the value is just there for comparison. You won't be able to use it by, by saying, well, that's below the exposure limit, and therefore uh, my process will be, because you could be using a much more enclosed, smaller, smaller volumes, just a word of warning. Okay, at that point, I will um, I pass back or I can pass straight to, straight to Andy. Thanks very much, John. Really interesting there. And uh, yes, Andy, um, you've unshared your screen now. But thanks, John. So Andy, if you can share your screen and begin your presentation, that'd be great. Andy, uh, I don't think we can see your screen just at the moment. Hmm. Can you see it now? Uh, now? Uh, I'm afraid uh, I can't personally. Oh yes, here we go. There yeah, we go. It's now. come up. Excellent. <laughs> Andy, over to, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. So, yep. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Lawrence of Travis Perkins Tool Hire. Firstly, just to say thank you for TP being invited to participate in the testing and for uh, being able to attend the HSE's testing facility for, uh, for the purpose of it. So, Travis Perkins, what do we witness at the, uh, at the counter? With a network of over 430 full and satellite tool hard branches, Travis Perkins colleagues are seeing a bigger uptake in the request for dust extraction. Colleagues are finding customers coming to the branch they explain what tasks they've got to do and then ask us to provide the complete solution. We found that the electric cutters and dust extractors have been really received really well with customers. We've seen repetitive orders, even word of mouth with other customers coming in from where they have been told about the complete system. One customer in particular used a complete system on a project in London the site health and safety officer was so impressed that they put it forward and it was published on the considerate construction scheme best practice hub. We're also what we're seeing is we're seeing a change in how customers want to be perceived by their own client. They want to look professional. They want to arrive at their client's site with modern new equipment that's fit for purpose. And importantly, when they leave, they want to leave the job in a clean, tidy condition. We're seeing that there is a greater growing demand from the local housing repair customer base for dust extraction. This is not only limited to silica dust, but also to control wood dust. Hiring dust extraction systems for our customers means we can offer a truly complete solution, resulting in them having happy clients, as there's less mess to be cleared up. Along with this, it offers health benefit to their client, the operator, and any other trades on the same job. Customers are now starting to request dust extraction more frequently, even to fit onto their own tools. Branch colleagues do still have to prompt customers at times by making them aware of dust extraction, but this leads to a trustful relationship being built and repeat orders. We have come across some customers that they're unaware of the different filtration classifications. They believe using a standard unclassified vacuum is adequate when it's being used for on-tool dust extraction, not realizing they could be dispersing the very fine dust particles into the surrounding airspace. 
So the, the testing at the uh, HSL, HSE, there was myself and a colleague, Gary Cook, were invited to assist in the testing of three different electric cutting dust extraction systems. Firstly, was to unpack all of the new tools, then read the manufacturer's operation instructions. All three machines had different methods of connecting the dust extractor to them, from a dust port, an elbow type adapter, and a clip on shoe that the hose connected to. Again, all these three machines had different methods of using them in the cut. These varied from pushing, pulling, moving the machine forwards and backwards. This did make a huge impact on the ergonomics when using the machines. The three machines all had different types of blade guards, ranging from the blade being enclosed to about 50% of the blade being exposed. All systems were tested using the machine's own brand of blade, and we had a spare blade if uh, required in the test room. As we were using the systems, you could see some dust escaping while using the equipment. The full extent of how much was in the air was clear when you finished the testing. You'd find uh, moving an object that had been resting on the surface would leave a silhouette of that object. Travis uh, Perkins' reaction for the test results. Um, clear, easy to understand. They were plotted on a bar chart, so it's very easy to see the performance of each system. From having used the different systems, we suspected there would be differences in the results. Again, this was due to what you could see in the air whilst in the test room. What you could not tell at the time was how different each test result was going to be. This is where the HSL's HSC report comes in as an independent test result. Next, next steps for us as, as Travis Perkins is to continue to stock dust extractors as a core range item in every Travis Perkins branch that offers tool hire. Continue discussions with our suppliers. What's new to the market? Is it suitable for the half fleet? This leads to the continued development of our half fleet to include additional new items that help reduce dust when carrying out a task. We'll continue to work closely with our suppliers and customer base to ensure the products are what the customer wants. If our customers don't like it, then they won't want to use it. We'll continue engaging with our suppliers and customer base to promote new products, methods of controlling construction dust. Again, we'll do further product knowledge to our branch colleagues so they can inform customers about new products and the benefits of using them. Continue to link and promote dust extractors to products in the tool hire catalogue and on the website. And we'll continue to update the tool hire guide and website to show new products to help increase awareness. Thank you for listening and uh, back to you now, uh, Neil. That was great. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, so that's uh, all three of our presentations. I'm just going to bring my screen back up. Right, so we've just got some time now uh, towards the end of the session for some questions and answers. There's been quite a few uh, questions that we've had come through. Uh, so uh, just, just to address one thing before I start running through the questions, uh, a couple of people have asked um, if the presentations are going to be made available afterwards. Just so that you all know, uh, we are actually recording this session and uh, the full recording will be available for you to view at your leisure. Uh, and I think we're going to be sending a link through to that. Uh, it should also be hosted on the Construction Manager website. Uh, I'll provide a couple more details about that uh, towards the end of the session. So as I mentioned, we've had, uh, we've had a few questions coming through on the Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to run through the ones that we've received, uh, starting with uh, a question from Steve Eads, uh, who asks if there's going to be research into other types of dust that pose a carcinogenic, a carcinogenic risk, such as wood dust. Um, now, I'm just going to make sure that uh, Andy and Matthias are unmuted, as well as John, so that you're able to uh, answer that question. So uh, is anybody uh, able to take that one, first of all? 
I, I'll pick up on that uh, with a with an answer, if that's okay. Maybe not the full answer, but yeah, there's been quite a, a bit of research looking at the effectiveness of controls. So uh, HSC's done some research, look at uh, particular things like table saws, and it's usually again the 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 the, the processes that generate uh, kind of high velocity jets. And I'm sure there was uh, a study done recently looking at the um, effectiveness of a whole range in a woodworking shop. So that range from wall saws to, to routers, et cetera. Um, I, I'm uh, not sure, Neil, how I, I, perhaps I could send some links. I'm not, I, I probably can't do it while I'm sat here at this laptop, but I could possibly send some links to the research if they're interested in that. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, We've also got a couple of questions uh, that are, are sort of linked here. So I'm going to start off with Michael Brown's question, which is, he asks, uh, are you aware of any plans for, for HSC labs bringing in more conformity assessments for extraction uh, to ensure that industrial partners and manufacturers are meeting the EU uh, and British standards uh, required? So, uh, John, is that perhaps one for you? Okay, yeah. Um, right. If you're interested in extraction, the, the, the document that that HSC kind of relies on as guidance. It's, our, it's HSC's own guidance doc, document. It's HSG 258. And that outlines uh, how early, uh, how early, because we talk about extraction, it's local exhaust ventilation. And incidentally, if you hook up a vacuum unit with the duct into your tool, it's, it's local exhaust ventilation. And that outlines what a HSC expects within that guidance document 258. So it can't comply with COSH. Um, now in the UK, uh, EN and um, BS standards are treated as guidance. In some countries, they're treated, have, have a greater legal standing. In the U UK, they're guidance. And usually uh, HSE will say, if you're complying with what's in a standard on the measurement, then we're usually happy with that. Um, we have got a, a project at the moment live on, on uh, local exhaust ventilation, but in particular, we're looking at recirculating systems. So we're looking at efficiency of filters and and that does link into some of the standards uh, on how filters are marked, which, which are the best filters to use, um, et cetera. So that, that project is live and that is a, a literature based study at the moment, looking at standards for filtration for LEV. Um, we, we usually, there's usually some, some research ongoing, as I say, it all depends um, at the moment, we are doing quite a lot on COVID, as you would imagine, but uh, we will be um, hopefully kind of returning to more uh, other airborne contaminants other than, uh, than uh, the coronavirus. Um, so for extraction, that's the main document we want to look at, 258. Um, and as I say, if you look at the HC webpage, you can search for the research um, folders called RR reports, and, and you can then search to see if there's anything there that... Uh, grabs your attention on extraction because obviously extraction covers a huge range of subjects from microbiological safety cabinets right through to, 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 the, you know, to construction welding, et cetera. So there's quite a bit published on welding for on torch control uh, on welding. Um, and there was recently, we did some work looking at uh, uh, cutting of, of stone as well in the lab, looking at a different kind of suite of controls you could use for that. Okay, that's great. Thanks, John. And I suspect this might be a question for you too. Uh, Mark Norton's asked, how do we get our tools tested for hazardous silica dust collection? Our tools capture up to 99.5% and we would like to have our tools tested. We have masonry and tile saws with a built-in extraction system. Now, I think Matthias has already posted a link uh, related to this question in the chat, but John, is there anything else that you would wanted to add about that? Um if it's if it's a standard testing against a published standard, then we, we do do some of that testing in the lab, lab on a commercial basis. It, you, it will just be a report detailing how it complies, uh, rather than kind of giving you any 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 comments. It's, it's a test report, but I, I would imagine that there will be other places that you can get that testing carried out. Um, it depends on which standards you're going to you, you want to test against. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, now, we've got a question from John McDonald. Uh, this, I think, is probably quite a broad area, so I think we'll just touch on this one uh, fairly briefly, if, if we may, but it's a valid question, so I'm just going to ask it quickly. Uh, has there been any knowledge transfer from the British coal mining industry's experience of working with dust, he asks. Good question. Uh, it's a long time since I've been down a mine. Um, not, not a pleasant place looking at extraction. I, I almost have to say I'm, I'm unsure. I know quite a, 
a lot of people that came from the mining industry on extraction actually went into LEV. Um, but the principles are the same. The, the kind of the, 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 the engineering principles of how you design hoods will be the same, whether it's for mining um, or for, or for c construction. But I would hope there has been some knowledge transfer. Great, okay. Now, uh, Willem Heard has asked an interesting question here about RCS. And, and when RCS dust became classified as carcinogenic, can someone enlighten us on that one? Uh, I'm not a regulatory inspector, so I don't always have this information to hand, but I think it was about 2019, I think. Um, I believe it was uh, actually January this year, January 2020. Right. Okay, that's great. I think Thank just, you. just to add, in some respects, because it's got such an expo a low exposure limit, the controls you apply um, will be the same. You would, you would, to get down to 0.1 cubic milligrams per cubic meter, you will be applying as extrin stringent controls. And in effect, it, it almost becomes the same as as low as reasonably practicable for carcinogens. Okay. Um, a question here about uh, RPE, which is from Hazel Bergen. Uh, she said that our health and safety consultant has advised against face uh, testing for RPE during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, your thoughts on this, please? So this is obviously quite a topical one. Um, you no, know, you can do face fit testing. Um, you, you obviously need to bear in mind social distancing. If you look on the HSE website, um, I've just quickly searched. Uh, yeah, I found it. Yes. If you type face fit testing HSE COVID, anything like that, it'll come up. But it, it tells you one, there's a nice video there um, showing you how to put on uh, a respirator. Uh, but uh, also, there is some information on minimizing the risk of transmission when face, face fit testing. Uh, it just incidentally, I, I've been face fit tested loads of times during the, the uh, pandemic because I've been a volunteer for uh, trying um, RPE on uh, we, whilst we've been testing the effectiveness. And it, 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 you can do it, but usually rather than it being fitted by the tester, you fit it yourself and the tester remains at a suitable distance and, and, and basically tell you that what the instructions are and they'll be wearing appropriate RPE as well. So it can be done, but it's a little bit more involved. Interesting. Okay. Uh, briefly, because um, again, this is a very broad area, but someone's asked uh, about asbestos exposure and how it compares to silica exposure. Can, can we, is there a succinct answer to that one? Um, all, all different materials that you're working with on stone will con diff contain different amounts of silica. Um, I don't know what the percentage in plasterboard it's likely to be. I don't know, it could be low, um, but it, it's likely to contain some silica. I, I probably can't add more than that, but if you ever look on this, uh, I'll just see if I'll, I'll find it for the next question, but there is some uh, downloadable guidance on that, which gives you a table and tells you the amount of silica in different materials or an average of the, of the silica content. I don't know if anybody else has, uh, would, would know more than me on, uh, on plasterboard. Does anybody else want to jump in there? No, okay, well, well, we'll come back to that one potentially if anyone else has uh, something to add on that. Um, we've got a question here from an, anon an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, how can we make sure site level operatives feel able to say no to unsafe practice? Uh, obviously, that, I guess, applies to all sorts of different situations that, and not just necessarily things like RCS. But um, what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, sorry, Neil, I can't see that question, sir. Yeah. This is yeah. Matthias. Um, maybe a few thoughts from, from my side. Um, I, I think one of the key things here is education and awareness. Um, it's very important that the, the operators on job sites are aware of the key threats that they face health and safety wise. And when they know more, um, my strong belief is that they will be feeling more comfortable and more confident in also challenging uh, the circumstances and situations uh, in, in their job sites. Uh, I also feel that companies have a major role to play here. It, it, it really boils down to the company culture and whether health and safety is 
taking seriously or not. And I've seen many company presentations and um, statements how health and safety, zero accidents, etc., are high on the priority list. And uh, from my side, I would really like to urge my colleagues in the industry to really live up to that promise and, 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 and those, those false statements. Unfortunately, um, when I'm going around the country, I still oftentimes do observe that uh, the reality is not quite, quite that yet. But uh, education, um, raising awareness, um, and of course also regulations and requirements from the government side to how businesses need to run and what kind of environments they need to provide to their, to their workers is, is um, in key importance. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, moving on to a, a question about uh, on-tool uh, extraction, uh, which might be another one for you, I guess, Matthias. This is from Philip Davis. He asks, when cutting um, wood on a construction site, they're using on-tool M or H class extraction. Is RPE also still required? I, I can, can perhaps add to that. I think it, it, it's um, it would. It, sorry, it's one of these answers that is it depends. Um, right. cutting, cutting wood dust. I know for, for for if I give an example on sanding, the measurements we've done for sanding with a good on tool extraction, you would not need a, a respirator because uh, you are well below the exposure limit. Cutting wood dust is again a little bit more energetic. It depends on the design. It really does. Um, cross cut saws. Um, it depends also how long you, you're in the space for, how long, how long you, you, you work in there, but no, cutting stone with the, an exposure limit of 0.1, uh, which is, a, you know, as we mentioned earlier, is a, such a low limit compared to, to, to other um, dusts, then it's likely that you, you may need a, a, a PP, PPF3, FFP3, sorry, uh, as, as well. Okay. All right, so a bit, a bit of a, a nuanced uh, situation there. Depending on yeah, the I think it really does depend on, on, on the situation uh, yeah. and how long you're cutting and whether indoors, outdoors, and, and also the ability of the tool, um, yeah. you know, how enclosed the blade is and, and et cetera. So it's a, it is a tricky one. I, I would add, add if you, you really want to look at how your tool performs, just, just get a floodlight behind it and stand on the other side and you, you'll you be able to see how much dust is, is actually being emitted and where it can be quite quite surprising. Great, okay. Uh, what about, uh, we've got a question here from Julie Gelder uh, who asks, what good extraction systems are there for mixing DPM, plaster, etc., particularly in buckets? Any thoughts on that? We're, we're, we're moving away from cutting obviously here, but um, just if anyone's got brief, brief thoughts on that one. It's, it's Andy here right now. Is that was that for mixing plaster in um, in buckets with a, a paddle mixer? Is that the question? Um, uh, I, unfortunately, uh, Andy, we don't have that detail, but, but let's make that assumption and, and perhaps you can... There are, on, on the market, there is available um, attachments that links onto a dust extraction system and you can hook onto the edge of your mixing bucket that will um, effectively draw out as you, as you start to mix and you get the initial powder movement will remove that from uh, from harm's way until it's then sort of all become mixed up into the water and settled the dust down so there is attachments available on the market okay great thank you uh, i think julie's just confirmed yes that was that was the kind of thing she was asking about so thank you uh, uh we've got a question here also from uh, harry patani um how critically is this problem, I think the problem generally of dust, uh, captured in construction phase documentation? Can anyone help us with that one? Yeah, Did sorry, anyone um, catch that question? Yes, yeah, so I'm not familiar with the, uh, the documentation, but you, you, you would clearly think, need a risk assessment before you, you, you carried out any, any work. Okay, well, um, Harry, if, if you're still in the session, we'll, we'll try and get back to you on that one. Uh, hopefully we can find somebody who can help you a bit further with that question. Um, moving on to a question from Delroy Wallace. Uh, just like with asbestos, is there a recorded register for silica activities? John, is that something you can help us with? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not close enough to the, um, to the asbestos one, but uh, I, not that I know of, um, but I, um, I will make a note and um, with, uh, ask a colleague who may be in a better position than me. So I can, I can, I can make a note and, and perhaps get back to Delroy later. Okay, thank you. And there's a question here, actually already been answered, I think, uh, privately um, through the system, but I just wanted to ask the question in case this was of interest to anybody else. But Audrey Silver has asked, uh, where does plaster dust sit in all of this uh, uh, gypsum and lime-based plaster? Um, so can anybody perhaps uh, help us with that one? If, if you want to get the, the um, contact details, I'll, I'll dig out some info I've got on plasterboard and gypsum content and, and you can share it over at a later date. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I've just a question myself too, and I think this is something that, that came up actually in some of our uh, earlier discussions as, as well, which is just about smaller sites. How, uh, when it comes to raising awareness of, of uh, some of the health uh, implications uh, that are posed by dust on construction sites. How do you get the awareness out to smaller sites and smaller operators? And how do you make the case for changing the way in which people do things on site? This, Matthias, um, some perspectives. Of course, it's not easy. It's easy to go through large organizations that typically have um, designated health and safety teams, functions, health and safety officials, et cetera. Um, but when we talk about men in a van going from a site to site, of course they are harder to reach. Uh, but that's why uh, media like construction manager, uh, webinars, et cetera, are important because these are ways for us to increase um, overall awareness. Of course, when, when smaller, smaller companies and, and players work with, the, with, the, uh, with, with larger construction companies. Hopefully that provides also a learning opportunity, seeing how uh, these matters are well taken care of. Now from Hilti side, we have around a thousand uh, team members in the country of whom over 500 work directly with customers, typically mid-sized to large, but we also do work with, with smaller customers. And, and certainly from our side, we do our best to educate um, our customers of um, best practices what comes to productivity and health and safety. I understand that um, key players in the industry like Travis Perkins, uh, rental players that typically receive a lot of uh, calls from and, and visits from, from uh, you know, the smaller players, subbies, uh, also their visit to depot like Travis Perkins provides certainly an opportunity to, to educate. When somebody comes and, and, uh, and um, plans to uh, rent a, a concrete cutter, it would be a very natural opportunity for the for the rental depot agent to ask, uh, what are you planning to do with it, and and propose that it really comes with uh, with the appropriate dust extraction systems. But I said it's not easy, and there's no silver bullet. Um, but that's why uh, it's so important we come together as an industry because alone none of us can really make a change. But together we can start to um, start to make a, a change that really uh, is of substantial scale. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you, Matthias. I think that's a good point to end on. We've, we've run through most of the questions that we have there. I think there's one or two quite specific uh, questions that uh, we will try and, and find uh, individual responses to after the session. Uh, but uh, for now, I'd just like to say thank you very much to our three speakers, Matthias Janefelt, John Saunders and Andy Lawrence. And also thank you very much to Hilti for supporting this session. Um, just to make a note, I think I mentioned this earlier on, but just to say again, this webinar will be available to view uh, on demand. Uh, and you can also find out news of all of our other digital events coming up on www.constructionmanagermagazine.com. Uh, but for now, uh, just to say thank you very much all of you who've attended today's session. I hope you found it useful. And uh, that's the end of today's session. Thank you.